This fifth lecture, we want to talk a moment about uh, Columbus's pitch. That is his, uh, the argument that he made to try to get financial backing for what appeared to be a pretty crazy idea. Uh, Columbus uh, believed that the world was much smaller. In 1492, of course, there was no Western Hemisphere, nor was there a Pacific Ocean. Uh, so it would appear uh, to Columbus, by looking at the maps available to him, that he could sell directly from Spain uh, a short trip to China. So we'll look at Columbus's maps and we'll look at uh, Columbus's pitch here. Uh, I want you to be aware that Columbus had traveled to the various um, capitals of Europe seeking financial backing, uh, royal backing for this uh, adventure of his. Uh, he had failed in gaining financial support. Finally, in 1492, um, this coincides with the expulsion of the Moors or the Muslims uh, from Spain. Isabella and Ferdinand had uh, gathered the Christian armies and had driven the Muslims and the Jews, for that matter, uh, across the Strait of Gibraltar into North Africa and were in a celebratory mood when, uh, when they summoned Columbus um, back to the royal household for another interview. Imagine if you're Christopher Columbus, you've got 15 minutes with the King and Queen of Spain, and this is your last shot of convincing them to support uh, your grand adventure. Uh, Columbus laid out uh, arguments in order to entice the king and queen into their support. Here, is the, here, are, the, here are the arguments that Columbus made. Uh, he said, first of all, that he would uh, secure vast quantities of gold. Uh, he, had, he knew from reading Polo's book that the Far East was awash in gold and other precious metals. Uh, and he could enrich uh, the Spanish kingdom um, in his journey. So gold was key. Uh, not only as an inducement for the king and queen, uh, but if you read Columbus's journal, you will see that gold is a, a fixation with uh, the great admiral. Uh, he uh, badgers the natives in, uh, in the New World, constantly asking for gold. Uh, the natives get wary of him and constantly tell him that gold's on the next island over. Uh, you get the sense they're just trying to get rid of him uh, as a sort of noisy and um, obnoxious house guest. Uh, gold, the first argument. The second, of course, is spices. Um, even today, uh, when you go to the supermarket and you go to the spice rack, I want you to notice the price per pound for imported spices. Uh, saffron and pepper, uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves. Uh, these things were extremely expensive in 1492 and they remain extremely expensive. Now, not only were these spices expensive, but they were relatively inaccessible. They, uh, they grew on the other side of the world. Uh, pepper, of course, grows in India. Uh, many of these other spices grew in the Malaccas and in Indonesia, Malaysia, and in the Far East. So Columbus is promising to bring these spices directly back to Europe. Uh, previously, these spices uh, would have to make their way across the Eurasian mainland and go through a number of what historians call Muslim middlemen. And you know what the middleman does, he tax on uh, um, or he extracts profit from the exchange, thereby driving up the price of pepper or cinnamon or nutmeg or what have you. So as, uh, let's, t let's take the example of cloves. Cloves are grown in the Moluccas as they make their way westward across Eurasia at each stop, uh, whether it was Bombay or Basra or Cairo or finally Venice or maybe uh, Genoa where Columbus is raised. At each stop an exchange is made and the price of these uh, imported spices skyrockets. Uh, I don't know the exact uh, inflationary number that we could pin to this price but they probably rise by more than a thousand percent from the place of their origin to, the, uh, to their final destination. So Columbus's idea is very attractive. Uh, spices, of course, are um, useful in masking uh, uh, bland food or even food that might be going bad. Uh, a little uh, cracked black pepper 
can mask the taste of, uh, of bad food. Uh, spices are also, of course, uh, a status symbol. They're quite expensive. Um, and one who possesses spices obviously has connections or wealth. Uh, you could use spices to pay your taxes. You could use spices to buy real estate um, in medieval Europe. So Columbus's proposal is quite attractive. He's going to bring the spices directly to Christian Europe, avoiding the Muslim middlemen who are scattered across the Muslim kingdoms of the Middle Ages. And here we're talking about the Mughal Empire and, uh, and today what we would think of as India and Pakistan, um, the Safavid Empire and uh, what we would think of today as Iran, and of course the Ottoman Empire centered in Turkey and uh, extending through the Middle East and North Africa. So the avoidance in, of these Muslim middlemen will save Europeans a lot of money and Columbus is promising uh, to accomplish this. So this is very attractive to the king and queen. Columbus promises uh, new land, uh, new lands that he discovers he'll claim for the king and queen of Spain. Uh, this is another inducement. Also part of his pitch uh, is this new route to the east. Instead of trying to go south and uh, across the Cape of Good Hope and getting into the Indian Ocean, Columbus is going to go directly west. Again, uh, there's no Western Hemisphere in 1492, and there's no Pacific Ocean. So he's going to rapidly uh, cross that narrow ocean that encircles the Earth, uh, what we would call the Atlantic, and arrive in China in no time, safely, quickly. Uh, another inducement, silk. Uh, we know from, or Columbus knows from reading Polo's book, that China is, uh, has an abundance of silk. And silk, of course, is also a status symbol on top of being uh, much more comfortable than coarse wool. Um, another inducement, uh, another part of Columbus's pitch um, is the conversion of the vast multitudes of people in China and elsewhere to Christianity. Uh, it would be difficult to overemphasize the piety or the uh, uh, the devoutness of the king and queen of Spain, as well as Columbus. These are serious Catholics. Now, to be able to convert the vast heathen mobs of the East to Christianity, uh, we're talking uh, in the millions, this would most assuredly um, earn you a seat at the right hand of God for eternity, or at the very least, nomination for sainthood. So. These are all serious um, uh, arguments made to gain backing, royal backing. The final argument that Columbus makes, and you can read this in his journal, he tells the king and queen of Spain that he intends to shake hands with the world's most powerful man to make diplomatic contact uh, with the descendants of the great Khan. I mentioned Kublai Khan in our last lecture, the Mongol ruler over China, uh, the so-called Wan Dynasty. Uh, I should mention uh, Kublai Khan's grandfather, who got this whole Mongol ball rolling back in the uh, 13th century. And that is, of course, Genghis Khan. Uh, Genghis Khan is significant because he takes all these uh, scattered nomadic tribes on the steppe lands of Central Asia organizes them together into one great nation and then proceeds to conquer most of the known world with these nomadic horsemen. So um, Genghis Khan's grandson Kublai Khan is known to Columbus from reading Polo's book and of course uh, Columbus assumes that descendants of the great Khan still rule in China. So he intends to make uh, diplomatic contact with the world's most powerful man. Now, he makes a point of telling Isabella and Ferdinand that the great Khan had in the past requested uh, European Christians to come to his court to instruct him in the, uh, the faith of Western Europeans. And of course, Columbus is a prime uh, candidate to carry out this task. So when you add up these various arguments, you see that they're quite uh, compelling. We have 
new Christian converts to the faith. After all, the king and queen had just driven um, the Muslims and the Jews out of Spain and had reconquered the Reconquista, had reconquered Spain for Christian Europe. Um, the inducement of gold uh, to enrich the kingdom, uh, the easy access to spices which were not only inaccessible but exorbitantly expensive as they made their way across Eurasia and the various Muslim middlemen, uh, new routes to the east, new lands to be discovered. These are all uh, silks and the other um, trade goods available in China. These are powerful arguments, and uh, finally, Columbus is uh, successful in convincing the king and queen of Spain uh, to help finance his project and to give it their royal blessing. So in 1492, Columbus will set sail with three small ships, and uh, he will begin crossing the Atlantic. Again, Columbus believes that his, uh, uh, his destination, China, uh, will be reached quickly and safely. Uh, with that said, uh, we're going to take a break here and when we come back, we're going to look at Columbus's maps to see what the world looked like to Christopher Columbus in 1492. Thank you.